Uh, good morning, everybody. It's uh, my privilege to be able to bring the message to you this morning. Greg's not well, uh, which is a bit of a shame, especially as for the next couple of weeks he's going to be on holidays. So it's not a very good start, but uh, it's my privilege, as I said, to lead us this morning with the message. As uh, Gail has said, we're talking about shining like stars. And when Helen and I, a number of years ago, on one of our trips to America, uh, I happened to spy a bookshop. And as someone who loves reading, we had to go in, didn't we? And Helen said, be careful. But while I was in there, I came across this particular book by Reggie White, a famous American football player. Uh, Reggie was six foot six, weighed 136 kilograms. And because he was a trained Baptist minister, uh, picked up the, the title of Minister of Defence because he was regarded as one of the, the greatest defensive linemen of all time in the history of American football. I mention it because as we are aware as uh, Australian rules fans, we're getting close to the finals. In America, the football season is just beginning. And uh, as a fan of the Philadelphia Eagles, who Reggie played for in the early part of his career, I had to buy the book. Sadly, uh, Reggie died back on Boxing Day in 2004. He had uh, arrhythmia and a couple of other things that weren't right, and he was only 43 when he passed. So it was a real loss. One of the interesting things that he did was uh, he was regarded as a bit of a messianic theologian, uh, looking very closely at the history of the Jewish people and Judaism. Well, enough about that. But I wanted to read through uh, some words that he wrote, which had the title, The Most Overrated People in America. And it could just as easily be the most overrated people in Australia. This is what he had to say. Football has made me a celebrity and I accept that, but I don't glory in that for my own ego enlargement. I understand and continually remind myself of something that I think a lot of celebrities forget. Celebrities don't deserve to be celebrities. Celebrities have not acquired godhood simply because they are idolised by the public. The fact is, celebrities, be they athletes, actors, authors, entertainers, are the most overrated people in America. People make heroes out of us and say that we are great. Most of us in the entertainment business, and let's face it, professional sport is about entertainment, do not use our celebrity status wisely or well. We do not use it for the benefit of others. In fact, many of us end up being killed by our celebrity status, by the money, power, sex and drugs that it can bring our way. It seems to me that the media has a lot to do with shaping values and ideals of our culture and especially the influence that it has on our younger people. Reggie finishes by saying, our nation cries out for role models, yet we keep making role models out of the rebels, the self-centred, the self-destructive, the outrageous and the promiscuous. I'd like to suggest this morning that unlike so many of our so-called stars of stage and screen, the rock music industry and the sporting arena, that we as Christians have every right to think of ourselves genuinely as stars. Not because we're famous in the way that the world considers fame, but because God calls us to be a presence for good in a world that is darkened by selfishness, conceit and falseness. For the Apostle Paul, the church at Philippi had a very special place in his heart. 
It was the first church that he established on the European continent. And in verse 6 of chapter 1, Paul calls the Christians there, dearly beloved. And then in verse 1 of chapter 4, he calls them, my joy and my crown. He was proud of these people at the way they were conducting themselves as followers of Jesus. Something that struck me as I read the opening of this letter was the way that Paul introduced himself. He didn't say that they were people who owed him their lives. He simply says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Not this or I am the apostle Paul or this is Paul, your spiritual father, your spiritual leader, but I am Paul, a servant. It's obvious that he wasn't a prima donna who had to be worshipped on or waited on hand and foot or someone with a fragile ego, ego who had to be treated with kid gloves. He was Paul, a servant, exactly the same as Jesus. And we read in Mark chapter 10 and verse 45, Jesus says, I did not come into the world to be served, but to serve. And Paul addresses these Philippians whom he loved as saints. They were normal, everyday people, just like you and me, but they were set apart. They were consecrated for the purpose of God's service. The same as Christians today, they had heard the good news of Jesus' sacrifice for them. They believed it. They had repented of their wrongdoing and they had invited Jesus to come into their lives to be number one and in control. When this happens, we are set apart to be used by God empowered with the spirit to make a difference in this world in which we live. The things that we say and do, or don't say and do, the attitudes that we have, the character that we display, must say something about God's presence in our lives, shining like stars. You'll notice from the reading that verse 12 begins with the word, Therefore, and those of us who have been around long enough will realise that something significant is going to be following on from this particular word. Paul says this, that he is wanting to draw a practical application from what he has just said in the previous 11 verses. In the first four, the theme on his mind is others thinking about others. His concern is that there be no disunity or conflict amongst his friends to whom he is writing. It's like he's saying, don't let a selfish attitude suck you in or sneak in like a thief and steal your joy or interrupt your closeness. The attitude that we have ought to be like that of our Lord Jesus, who we read a little bit earlier in Philippians chapter 2 and verses 5 to 8 that I'm sure will be familiar. Being in very nature God, Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Attitude is defined as a manner of acting, of feeling or thinking that shows one's disposition, opinion, and the way that we are thinking because how we think determines how we respond to others. I sometimes get a bit concerned when I see some people 
who look as if they've been baptised in vinegar. <laughs> Where is the joy of the Lord in our lives? For Paul, though, this experience of living with the right attitude is summed up in that word joy. It's interesting that he talks so much about it because when he's writing, he's doing so from prison in Rome. And the difficulty, though, that we have with joy is that we want to equate it with happiness. But joy is more than being happy. As Christians, we know that joy is one of the fruit of the Spirit, but to be joyful is to make a choice. It's an attitude that we have that stems from our confidence that we have in God, that he is at work, that he is in control, that he is in the middle of whatever it is that has happened, is happening or will happen to us. For Paul and for us, it's about being content in whatever situation we find ourselves. One poet, in talking about attitude, expressed it this way. He said, one ship sails east, one ship sails west, regardless of how the winds blow, but it's the set of the sail and not the gale that determines the way that we go. <coughs> so, armed with the right attitude and with consideration of others in all that we do, Paul then continues in verse 12 with encouragement. He says, keep up the good work, even though I am not with you, and perhaps even more so, continue to work out what God is his grace has worked in. In effect, he's saying, God has done something special in you. Now you have a responsibility to do something special about that. The idea of being active, of working out, is not just about what we might do in our church family. That's important. But it's thinking about what we might be able to do in the wider community as well as we move around amongst people. You know, working out is similar to a miner working in a mine to get the ore, or a farmer who is at work planting a crop so that he can get a harvest. In our culture today, we talk about going to the gym for a workout or to lose weight or improve our fitness. And so whether we're digging or farming or exercising, the effort that we put in will produce a profit. And this is why our being at worship on a Sunday morning is so important, because Christians' worship is a spiritual workout. It is not a spectator activity. By working out our salvation, we are living out our faith ultimately for the glory of God. In the living out of our faith, we are involved in the process of becoming blameless and pure, children of God. Of course, we all realise that we haven't arrived by any stretch of the imagination. But it is important that in the way that we think about our living, that we be people of faith, the children of God, putting our faith into action. And in a generation that is crooked and depraved, we are to be different. We are to shine like stars. I don't know if you're aware of it, but in our galaxy, the Milky Way, there is more than 100 billion stars. What does that say about God and his creative power? I'm not sure whether it might be 100 billion minus one, but uh, there is a thing called a star register. And one Christmas as a present, our older son gave his wife a certificate uh, registering her name uh, as being part owner of a star. It's on the wall in their home. 
She'll never get there, of course, to see it, but that doesn't matter. Back in 1967, the Nobel Prize winner for the Physics Award was a fellow called Hans Bate. He was a scientist who worked out how stars shine. They shine as a result of a nuclear reaction deep in their core where hydrogen is converted into helium using carbon and nitrogen as catalysts. And we probably think whatever that means, don't we? <laughs> but a star technically is a light emitting mass of gas. It's something full of energy and life and brightness. And the good news is that Paul likens us as that. Many of us would have grown up singing this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. But when I understand what Paul is saying about Christians being stars, I begin to think that this little light of mine ranks alongside of gentle Jesus, meek and mild, that it's pretty wussy, wimpy sort of stuff that denies the power of God that is working in us and through us. We can shine like stars because we possess the word of life, the word of salvation, which is life and which gives life. And we shine before the world through the sincerity of our manner, of the way in which we conduct ourselves. Because not only does the world hear the good news from us, but it ought to see our light shining in our daily walk. Hopefully, there is congruence between the two and that old saying that our walk matches our talk. And this will happen, and we look back at verse 14, when we do everything without complaining or arguing. Paul is saying, don't be negative. Be careful with your attitude. Complaining or grumbling or murmuring in some ways is more of a personal thing. It's something that we might do under our breath, whinging, if you like. This was the downfall of the people of Israel that we read about in the Old Testament. But to argue or to dispute is more public because it's vocal and it's argumentative and it often creates doubt and disturbed feelings in others. A Christian who is constantly grumbling or arguing or causing trouble will certainly not be shining like a star and sadly everyone will know about it. The reason is that the poison of pessimism is very difficult to get out of one's system. As lights shining in the darkness we are to be unhypocritical, people who are living with integrity above reproach, living with good moral character. As we shine like stars working out our salvation, so we are holding fast the word of life. Hopefully people will see our lives are different and our living, as Paul says, will not be in vain. Holding forth the word of life means holding on to the word of God and wanting to be obedient in all that it says. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2, the apostle says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. It also means involvement in evangelism, in sharing the good news with others, not necessarily standing on a street corner. Some people have the gift of doing that. It might simply be saying a particular word about who we are as God's children, maybe giving somebody a pamphlet to read, of referring a message that we might be aware of on YouTube, Sometimes little things that we don't even think about, but it's making a statement about the faith that we have in Jesus. 
Paul finishes this passage of scripture by reminding his friends that we are in this together, come what may. And I draw a great deal of comfort and encouragement and strength from that, to think that we live our lives as individuals, but we are part of a community of faith, part of God's family. Two quotes I want to finish with. The first is a word of caution, lest like the so-called stars of this world, we get carried away with our own importance. Talent is God-given, be humble. Fame is man-given, be thankful. Conceit is self-given, be careful. And the second is a comment by the Christian writer and pastor Stuart Briscoe, and he says this, it is not so difficult as it may appear to shine in today's world, because today's world is so wrong on so many counts that you shine just by being right. But it requires real honest to God living in the light of his word and the power of his spirit. Let us then go into this new week determined to shine brightly as stars for our Lord Jesus. Amen.